It's July 1989, a month like any other in the Soviet Union for the miners of Siberia. Like every other day in the life of the USSR, they showed up for work dutifully. There had been little in terms of serious revolts in the USSR for miners, or for any workers for that matter. And after all, the union was owned by the party. These were not workers known for their capacity for revolt, especially not in Siberia. But that day, after a lifetime of toil in the dark mines, shift leader Valery Kukorin and his colleagues walked off the job. They had finally had enough. They were tired of bad pay, poor housing, lack of electricity, of being pushed around by party cronies. But most of all, they're tired of not having enough soap. Enough soap to wash the grime off of their bodies. They demand something simple, the dignity not to be dirty. Labor relations in the USSR were a tricky business due to the fact that the very people responsible for negotiating for you were also in the party you were attempting to negotiate with. Imagine a labor negotiation with your boss, where your boss also owns your union. As a result, strikes were a relatively rare phenomenon in the USSR, and when they did happen, they were often quite violently repressed. The Novocherkask massacre in 1962, officially a state secret until 1990, is one of the most prominent examples, where 24 people were killed and hundreds arrested after a simple strike. This was first revealed in the Gulag Archipelago, Solzhenitsyn's famous book, banned until 1990. But the rise of Mikhail Gorbachev had opened a door to a new era in the Soviet Union, or depending on who you ask, it accelerated a crisis already in motion. The Gorbachev-era policies of glasnost, meaning transparency, and perestroika, meaning restructuring, attempted to deal with the changing nature of the Soviet Union and the breakdown of the Soviet command economy. Glasnost meant a new way of operating for the Soviet state, less censorship, more visibility into the machinations of the government. And perestroika meant, ironically, the survival of the socialist state by introducing free markets and more autonomy for other parts of the government. Gorbachev argued that these policies were necessary to recover the Soviet Union from what he called the era of stagnation. Indeed, the Russian economy in the 80s did struggle with a number of economic malaises, graft from corruption, inefficiencies in the labor process, difficulties obtaining raw materials, the fiasco in Afghanistan, hangovers from the oil crisis, etc. From the Brezhnev era onward, the USSR did experience growth, but struggled to compete with the US in comparison. Whatever the reasons, economists agree that the USSR's stagnation was very real. But in some ways, these policies themselves initiated more frustration than before. Look at it. They gave me only one bar, only one bar of soap. For one month, try to do your laundry with that. That's what they gave me, one bar. And as the economy began to collapse, workers across the Soviet Union felt more empowered than ever to take control themselves. In essence, as people became poorer, they had less to lose. And the stability of the USSR would never be the same. The control of the one-party state would be permanently and decisively scrubbed away. Whether this was the original plan of Gorbachev and his wing of the party is hard to say. But while many in the West understand the impact of the Baltic revolutions, the fall of the Berlin Wall, etc. on the dissolution of the USSR, the miners' strike may have played just as large a role in the collapse of the Soviet Union as any other element. Gorbachev himself remarked to the party congress that the miners' strike placed the state under greater stress than even the Chernobyl crisis. The miners spontaneously walked off the job site, first in Siberia, then in every other mine in northern Russia, then later all over the Soviet Union. The strike spread from Ukraine in the west into Sakhalin in the far east. They had simple requests. Since the creation of the USSR in 1922, while the rest of the country had modernized, miners had continued to live in an almost quasi-surf state, despite the progression to socialism elsewhere in the country, and could not depend on basic amenities. They lived in tiny ramshackle houses, they could not count on consistent electricity, and the food supply was quite precarious. A coal miner named Nikolai has invited me home. He lives in this neighborhood. These houses, made of wood and clay, may look picturesque, but miners loathe them. They have no running water or modern conveniences. 
Local party member Valentina Alisovna herself admitted, We live like pigs. I'm sorry to say it, but it's true. The mine is a century behind the times. When we go home, we can't count on electricity. The water goes out on us. I'm no capitalist, but it's obvious this system has done nothing for us. Miner Anatoly Malikin recounted the following, This is not a life for human beings. We have no time for leisure. We have no decent clothes. We spend our entire lives making just enough to feed ourselves and our children. The shift starts at 6 a.m., so you have to be up at 4.30. You go to the mine, work eight hours underground, and all your life is work. When you come home, you are too exhausted to do anything but collapse. On the weekend, there are chores to do at home. About the only leisure we have is a mug or two of beer in the morning after the night shift. That's it. And then you quit, if you haven't already been killed in an accident. A few years later, your lungs give out, or your heart goes. Bye-bye. You're dead. Maybe the simplest complaint was that the 200 grams of soap for their monthly ration was simply not enough to actually clear the soot and grime off of their bodies from a long day in the mines. It's unclear what specific complaint actually pushed them over the edge to feel so bold as to protest like at no other time in the history of the USSR. Maybe it was Glasnost and Perestroika themselves that emboldened them. As miner Pyotr Kongurov put it, People are not blaming Gorbachev. They know they are able to strike because of Gorbachev. But on the other hand, they are waiting. And we can't wait forever. The miners had an intuitive sense of the televisual. Despite not having gone into the mines in several days, the miners would show up to protest dirty with their mining gear equipped for the cameras. At night, they would turn on their headlamps beneath the Statue of Lenin, understanding perfectly well the importance and irony of this juxtaposition. The party began to panic. Their first strategy, attempting to shame the miners by insinuating their strikes were going to kill old people and children, bore no fruit. As the winter approached, the party realized they were going to have to genuinely negotiate with the miners. The miners had successfully implemented perestroika from below. After successfully galvanizing both panic within the party and support among the broader public, the party began negotiating with representatives of the miners in Siberia and elsewhere in the USSR. Different regions exhibited different degrees of brazenness with their demands. For instance, miners in Forkuta in northern Russia held out longer than their counterparts, demanding the party loosen its grip on control of the state. They did not simply want additional soap. They wanted control of the actual working processes of the mine, control of the leadership, etc. But in the past, they've usually not had political demands. This time it has something very close to political demands, including a request that the local government people be ousted from office. Uh, but also, of course, they had pure economic and social demands and just ordinary demands just for a bar of soap. Now, one could just say, what do they mean by just a bar of soap? But there are enormous shortages of these kinds of goods, and they can't satisfy them right away, partly because of the lack of hard currency, because they can't produce it enough, or because they're inefficient in producing it. It's, you can come at it in many different ways. But in other regions, the concerns remained more basic, parochial food, soap, housing. Some miners felt it difficult to trust the party bigwigs. This was Moscow up to its old tricks again. But ultimately, the party and the miners would come to an agreement on ending the strike after certain conditions were met. And with some reservation, the miners returned to work. In some places, the party did indeed fulfill its promises. But after a while, it became clear that the state was incapable of actually meeting the conditions of the deal permanently. The workers lost faith and contemplated further strikes. The miners were not the only people fed up and ready to protest, however. Glasnost had permitted free elections in large swaths of the country. While imperfect, this did sometimes permit a genuine opposition to arise. The Interregional Group, which would contain Russian dissidents and intellectuals, also featured future Russian President Boris Yeltsin. The Interregional Group was eating away at the political unity of the USSR, while the miners were destroying its economic integrity. Problems mounted externally as well. The Hungarians opened their border to the west, effectively taking out the first pieces of the Berlin Wall, allowing East Germans to escape for the first time. By the end of 1989, the wall was toppled. David Hasselhoff, Freedom, Hamburgers, you know the deal. Germany is reunited. All through 1989 and 1990, the Baltics and other satellites began declaring sovereignty as Soviet republics, or sometimes outright independence. This was essentially barely resisted by Moscow, far too busy at home to deal with these crises. 
talking about the uh, change in the subject a little bit, talking about the different nationalities and all the, the different areas that Mr. Gorbachev has to deal with. Also this past week, uh, uh, recent developments in the Baltic states. Uh, explain for our viewers what's happening there. Well, in the three republics, so-called, uh, of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, there has long been a drive to get out and to be independent again as they were until 1940. As many cynically predicted, the original July 1989 agreement with Moscow had indeed collapsed. In October 1989, the miners protested a new law which had banned strikes in the energy sector by striking. Almost two years since the miners first walked off the job site in Forkuta, the miners began another strike in March 1991. Obviously unsatisfied with the concessions previously promised and half-delivered, this time they requested the government honor its original agreements, a wage increase of 150% and the right to retire after 25 years on the job, or resign. While not matching the scale of the 1989 strikes, the government clearly saw the threat. Prime Minister Valentin S. Pavlov complained on television, I would like to raise everyone's pay tomorrow as high as the miners wish. There's only one question, where will we get the money? The 1991 strikes were a ticking time bomb in a country already 5% behind on production. This time, there would be no promises made by Moscow. And after all, who would believe them anyway? The walls were closing in. Gorbachev began to find himself under increasing pressure as crises appeared all over the Soviet Union. The miners' strike would find a cousin phenomenon in the independence movements of the Baltic states in Georgia, Azerbaijan, etc. The Berlin Wall, the image of the Eastern Bloc, had fallen. States started proclaiming full independence like it was going out of fashion. It might be a bridge too far to argue that the miners' strike itself was the first domino that brought down the Soviet behemoth. After all, some Baltic states and Armenia had already begun claiming independence earlier in 1989, before the miners' strike took place. But the miners' strike began a crisis internal to the heart of the Soviet state, unlike the independence movements in a far-off satellite. It showed once and for all that the party was no longer in control, and that a genuine alternative existed for Russia in the USSR, albeit a murky, unclear one. Historians and researchers of the USSR have offered numerous theories for its collapse. The Chernobyl nuclear crisis is said to have radicalized the Ukrainian sentiments towards independence. The Afghanistan fracas, which ended in ignominious withdrawal in February 1989, is also blamed. Others blame the economy, the impact of television, excessive military spending to compete with the West, etc. But whatever factors tipped the country over the edge, it was one event that virtually ensured its destruction, the August coup. This is a special report from ABC News. Good morning. Mark the date well. August 19th, 1991. Historians are likely to be analyzing the events of this day for generations to come. Military leaders and the Soviet secret police have taken control of the government, and now Vice President Gennady Yanayev is sitting in the president's seat. The hardliners say the country has become ungovernable because of perestroika. Tanks are moving into the capital, taking up positions near key government buildings. Outside the Russian parliament building, crowds began gathering early this morning to hear Russian President Boris Yeltsin call for a general strike to protest what he calls an unconstitutional coup. Mikhail Gorbachev has been vacationing in the Black Sea Resort area and has not been seen since the takeover. The August coup would be the death rattle of the empire. August 19th, a number of hardliners calling themselves the State Committee on the State of Emergency, opposed to reform of the USSR, initiated a sloppy coup. They attempted to control a number of television stations, recognizing the increasing power of television in state management. They attempted to arrest both Gorbachev and Yeltsin, Yeltsin now president-elect, but only succeeded with the former. Yeltsin declares himself head of the Russian military, and perhaps illustrating the power of the miners, a new miner strike begins. Protesters took to the streets, rejecting the committee, forming human chains around the parliament. The coup fails, unable to garner sufficient support among the populace or the military. Gorbachev is again declared leader of the USSR, for now, and the coup leaders are arrested. Yeltsin saw his moment. On August 24th, Yeltsin demanded Gorbachev dissolve the party. That same day, the Ukrainian parliament declared Ukraine independent from Russia, explicitly referencing the August 20th coup. 
Gorbachev, for his part, attempted to salvage the preeminence of Russia in some sort of post-Soviet transnational union, but failed. The Ukraine would declare independence in July 1990. This set in motion many of the events we are now seeing in Eastern Europe today. On December 26, 1991, the Soviet Union dissolved, officially certifying Ukraine and Belarus as genuinely independent states. As Lenin once said, for us to lose the Ukraine would be to lose our head. The following decade would be one of Russia's most brutal since even the pre-Soviet era, with rampant crime and plummeting birth rates. Oligarchs took over control of major sectors of the economy. After a decade of crises under Yeltsin, Russians clamored for someone to deal with these problems and voted a new leader to power. There's an old saying that a small leak will sink a great ship. One day in 1989, brave miners decided that they'd had enough. They were going to take their lives into their own hands, and their decision contributed to the collapse of a global superpower. And the thing that started it all was soap.